Hey guys, Professor Bill of Comic Book University, and in this week's Spotlight on Story, we're going to be talking about Alpha Flight. Pretty much issue number one, but definitely a lot of two through four, because we're going to be doing mostly the Master of the World. You can check out the Explained in the Minute, uh, excuse me, 10 Things. I forgot I changed, I updated my uh, style. I do 10 Things About now, and I try to eke it into approximately a minute. Anyway, Master of the World. <laughs> So uh, he just made his uh, his reappearance in Champions issue number 20, Jim Zub, uh, Sean uh, Isaacs, and a lot of people asking me, who the frick is this guy? Well, okay, not a problem. Uh, here he goes. Mm -hmm. So there's that explained in a minute, and then there's this story, which features his origin. Now, the first issue of... Uh, uh, Alpha Flight is actually a fairly simple and easy one. There's this dude, he's just a freaky little dude, and uh, he wants to resummon the the ancient beasts, the great beasts of the of the North. So he's uh, he goes and he summons him, and he calls himself like Tundra, and he starts walking around lumbering, and and all the the good guys. Alpha Flight kind of reforms. Now the first time we really saw Alpha Flight was in uh, X-Men number 130, I think it was, something to that effect. And we don't really see too much of them afterwards. They went to try and pick up Wolverine and be like, hey, come back, you're gonna, you know, head up Department uh, H's uh, Alpha Flight program. You know, you're, you're Weapon X, I'm we Weapon Alpha, let's do this. Well, Vindicator, <laughs> Weapon Alpha uh, pretty much jacks up a, a, a civilian, <laughs> hurts him really bad, and he's like, I'm going to call myself Vindicator because I must now vindicate myself of this uh, accident where I almost killed a civilian. Well, he very quickly, <laughs> by issue two, starts calling himself the Guardian. So it's like, dude, what, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? And then later on, Heather Hudson, when she takes over the role of Guardian, she, um, uh, excuse me, yeah, that, uh, her husband, her dead husband, spoilers for the future, she becomes the Guardian instead. Anyway, so in this particular story, uh, issue one, and this is basically Alpha Flight coming back together again. Now you may be wondering who's the the writer, who's the the penciler, who's the anchor. It's John Byrne. All right, he does all of it, all of it. And uh, my recommendation: go and check out my interview with Richard Cumley. He is the creator of Captain Canuck. And in that interview, there's a very interesting <clears throat> concept brought up. <laughs> An interesting. Uh, a uh, tidbit from the past and uh, uh, Comic-Con gone just a little bit wrong in some regards that led to the creation of uh, Vindicator, Al Weapon, Alpha, Guardian, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> All right, James Hudson. So that's uh, very interesting. Anyway, so this is just basically everybody gets the call. Uh, Puck is actually in beta flight, but somehow he gets a call also by accident. Heather Hudson makes the mistake and calls him also. Anyway, uh, by the time he gets there, he has like no superpowers for the most part. At first, mind you, John Byrne didn't actually know what he was going to do with Puck. Uh, so... When they, when they check it out, it's like, you know, well, what am I going to do with him? Um, I don't know. Should we give him superpowers? Maybe. By issue two, they're like, yeah, he has no superpowers. He's just really highly trained. And then much later on, we learn that he does have powers. So let's get right into issue two. Okay, Vindicator's flying around, and it turns out there's some kind of a... Uh, an, uh, training program going on. They don't have a danger room, these poor guys. They just have the great wide open of the great white, nor great white north. So um, he's out there and uh, the buglers, Aurora and North Star, zip right past him at their faster than light speed abilities. And what happens is his force field and the, the tech of his, his suit actually shorts out and he starts falling. So now he suspected that would happen and it turns out it, it did, you know, in, in practice, better than theory. And he starts falling and he gets caught by Sasquatch, but he's on the wrong team. So Sasquatch goes and tosses him. And um, Michael Tuyungman, the, uh, the shaman, he's like, hey, he doesn't have his force field. He pulls out some magic powder. Ah! <laughs> Makes this tree just reach up and, and catch him. And they all go and have a, a cute laugh about it. Um, Walter Lankowski, uh, Sasquatch, he's like, hey, what are you doing? And Marina jumps up and she's like, ah, and throws some water at him. He's all wet. Puck is laughing. <laughs> These two go at it with each other. Um, a whole lot of fun. A lot of, you know, good times, good times. Anyway, uh, Puck winds up getting killed. No, I'm joking. Uh, but only partially. 
Um, for some reason, Marina, she starts feeling really weird. And she's like, oh, what's going on? And Puck is over there. He's like, oh, hey, you know, we're, we're, we're buds. You know, we were both in Alpha Flight. How you doing? What's going on? You all right? And she just kind of goes, don't touch me. He's like, no, it's it's okay. It's it's just me. She says, don't touch me. Rah! And these, these, you know, finned hands that she's got, suddenly she develops like lacerating claws and practically, it even says that, it practically disembowels Puck. This is where they first say, he doesn't have any powers. He can't regenerate like Wolverine and he's not very durable like you, Sasquatch. Like, he's probably going to die. So, fortunately, Shaman is actually one of the best surgeons in the world. So, he comes back and he starts, uh, he's going to help him out. Um, in the meantime, you learn a little bit more about uh, Marina and she, I'll probably start doing all of the explained in a minutes for these guys pretty soon, probably starting with Marina since so much of it isn't here. A lot of her origin will be revealed here in this, uh, this uh, spotlight and story I'm doing. So it turns out that Marina can swim at like 900 knots. <laughs> like it's, it's insanity how fast she goes. Um, yeah, just like in, in no time, it's like she hit 900 knots. Like that's just, that's crazy. Uh, so within seconds, so it was, it was easily in less than a minute. So anyway, they, um, uh, like nobody's able to find her. She just disappears completely. So everybody just redoubles her efforts to get Puck to a hospital. While he's there, um, uh, Michael Tuyungman, Dr. Michael Tuyungman, a shaman, he says, you know, you guys are going to go out and you're going to try and find Marina and see what's going on. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It turns out that she's still got her uh, her locator on her locator gem. So we can just tune in on that like a GPS. I don't think there actually was GPS at the time, but that's fine. That that works back in 1983. So um, uh, Michael Tuyman goes and says, may the beasts of the great north be with you or spirits of the north, whatever. Uh, just mentioning the name is enough for Aurora to suddenly get triggered. And she's like, "What? oh, Michael Tuyman, he mentioned the Beast of the North, he mentioned the, the Great Spirits. Interesting. So she, um, uh, what do you call it? She changes into Snowbird and then, or uh, yeah, and then she just kind of like flies out the window. So uh, we're going to learn more about her origins in issue six, I believe, which I probably will cover. So these guys are in the Omnijet. It's just a, a Canadian version of the Quinjet. Even though they haven't been fully reactivated yet as Alpha Flight, they're like on loan. Um, this mission will cause them to be fully reactivated because there's some serious threats. So they're going in, they're talking about, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, Marina. How there's this this guy, uh, this, this captain on a deck. What's his name? Sanderson here. I got uh, Tom Smallwood. He's the captain of this this merchant, uh, excuse me, this fishing ship, and he's there's a huge storm, and he goes out to try and pull in the nets, and he gets knocked overboard. And while he's down there, he sees something glowing at the bottom of the sea. He swims down, he picks it up, and comes back up. His his first mate's like yeah, and grabs him, and throws him back on board. And it turns out this is like this this weird egg. He's like, what's going on? What is this thing? It's glowing. He brings it back to his family. Anyway, they wind up hatching this egg, and Marina is inside of it. She's She was born of an egg, and she still thinks she's human, which is... That's cute. That's cute. You're not a human. You were, you were hatched. Anyway, so um, so that's kind of, you know, that. And they're talking about it because they're trying to figure, like, what you know, what do we know about her? Like, we don't really know that much about her, unfortunately. Um, even all the... She passed all of her psych, psych exams to be advanced to Alpha Flight, we didn't know that this could happen to her. We didn't even know she had claws, you know, pretty much. Uh, you know, how fast she could swim or anything. Uh, anyway, so she winds up going all the way up to the North Pole, and they're tracking her there. When she's getting up there, she's like, you know, look at this this big, gigantic glacier, this this weird-looking iceberg. There's, like, metal inside and, and, and pipes and tubes. What's going on? She follows this tunnel. She goes away in, and it's this weird sort of... Um, device she she uh excuse me um ship it turns out and she had this psychic premonition she's not psychic herself per se but she had this psychic emanation that she had to go up north to the ship and when she gets there she meets the master of the world now the master of the world is going to give his origin story here as he's torturing her oh yeah oh yeah there, there, there's there's a bit of torture here um 
basically, as everybody's going in and trying to find them, and there's a, uh, what do you call it? The ship is just really, oof. The ship is is not living per se, but it, it it's, it's like it is living, but it's not sentient. It, it it's gonna run on instinct that it that it knows. Basically, the the origin here, and this is gonna be given over two different issues: issue number three and issue number four. Basically, the ship comes from this Plodex uh, technology. This pl yeah, the Plodex technology. This is a species from just forever ago, forever ago, and. Um, uh, basically, uh, let's see, let's just start, I'm trying, like, there's two different stories I'm trying to blend in. Basically, they were this, this species that was just ridiculous. They would, they, they destroyed their own planet, not even through war, just using the, the natural resources of the planet. It was stripped bare. So they got this idea, listen, here's the deal. This is what we're going to do. We're going to spread out. We're going to conquer like crazy. All right. And the way that they're going to do it, um, there's, there's a whole lot of inspiration here, um, uh, um, from and to, but what happens is they, uh, make it so there's a whole bunch of eggs, the plot X eggs on the ship. And I'm talking millions of eggs. Now each egg has a soulmate, so to speak. So these eggs are going to stay dormant on this ship that is living ish but again non sentient it's only working on its its base controls so almost like an instinct so all these ships are sent out they land on a planet they kind of terraform with that portion of the planet they are going to summon uh they're going to put out a beckon so that all sentient creatures will want to start coming towards the ship now the first one to make it to the ship will be considered the the uh, representative of that planet. That person will be stripped down to practically molecules. Only the brain will be really left. And then they will rebuild this creature, this sentient creature from that planet, native to that planet. And the plot X will not necessarily look like that creature, but it could. Either way, it's the idea that it will... Um, it will have that genetic code so that you remember War of the Worlds, the big thing was uh, the, those aliens weren't used to our bacteria and whatnot here on Earth. Well, this makes it so they will be uh, uh, unsusceptible to the, to the bacteria and whatnot. They will, they'll be immune to any kind of disease and they will have a ridiculously long lifespan. Interesting, yes. So um, uh, 40,000 plus years ago, this one ship landed, the one ship that was destined towards Earth with many natural resources landed on Earth. Now, human beings date to back like, you know, 100,000 years ago, whatever, um, something to that effect, whatever it is. But 40,000 years ago, we were still effectively cavemen, okay? We we're, you know, uh, before that, there were much before that, there were just, you know, standard hominids all over the place, you know? But now, actual human beings, Homo sapiens, fully, you know, in existence, tribal, and all that crazy stuff. And this ship landed in the North Pole, except unlike all the other ships rather than landed, it crashed. You see, uh, the ship, one of the, the warp drives, I believe the one all the way on the left, <laughs> wound up blowing, and uh, it, it, it crashed instead. So the sentient program still took place, but it didn't work the way that it wanted to, and it landed in a very inhospitable part of the world, namely the North Pole. So when it shot out its eggs all over the place, millions of eggs, very few if, uh, very few of them survived. In fact, we only know of one offhand that did definitely survive, and that's Marina. Yes, Marina is actually a plot X. So uh, she was, you know, on the bottom of the earth, uh, the surface of the the, the, the the water, the earth's surface for, for so long and finally saved. And then when the um, the mother ripped open the, the egg, as soon as she touched, it's like, OK, cool, you're going to be a uh, female, whatever. And you're going to, you know, you're going to look like the human. Bang, there you go. So master of the universe turns out that he was actually uh, one of those cavemen back during the times, and he was excited. He was the strongest of them all. Uh, he used to give lots of food to, you know, the people and whatnot, but he was very antisocial. He would fight and even kill some of the others if they, they annoyed him in any way. So all of the, the other cavemen, they got together and they 
booted him. They exiled him. They weren't into killing. But exiling someone out on their own is not too different from killing them. It's just that, you know, as many, many times as he did almost die, Master of the World, his name was actually Ishu. He refused to die. So he, he lived. And he was trying to head south where he knows that it's better. And all of a sudden, he just gets this psychic signal. And he just, he can't help it. He starts going north. And some, like, he, he's able to, you know, you're, you're very rarely able to find any kind of food that far north, especially when you're walking. But all the other sentient creatures that tried to make it north, they died. So he was able to eat and survive on the sustenance of these recently dead and perfectly preserved because of the cold creatures as he's going north to what would eventually become this ship, this Plodek ship. He had no idea what was up there. So he finally gets there, and then he's freed from the control, but these tentacles come out like a good Japanese uh, hentai movie. <laughs> and he gets, like, sucked in, and fortunately, that's the only thing that happens to him. You know, it doesn't get completely penetrated, but he does have his skin ripped off, his bones scraped and everything, and he's conscious for all of this, and he feels the pain, and he goes crazy. It took him about 30,000 years after he was reconstructed to get his mind back. Um, now... I'm not entirely sure. I don't think that we know what normally happens to the uh, the native life form that would originally get brought there, uh, so they can have their DNA searched and everything to make the the um, in, the disease immune Plodex creatures born. But um, since none of the the, the Plodex made it except for the one, and she never came out. Um, she, uh, yeah, yeah, he was just by himself, so he just kind of stayed there. So he was able to regain his sanity after 30,000 years, and he had approximately 10,000 years to master the plot X technology. Um, pretty cool. So now he could, much like you know, Mr. Sinister can control a lot of or uh, inorganics around him to do what he wants. It almost looks like something that Magneto would do, except it's just his own base that he can do this with. Well, likewise, that's what Master of the Universe can do with this Plot X ship. Now, mind you, he can't leave. He can't leave. He can't get away. The only way for him to get out of there is to destroy the ship. But, much like um, most part most humans have it in them that they can't hurt themselves much like you know your tickle reflexes you can't tickle yourself you could be ticklish but you can't tickle yourself you have instincts to stop you to prevent you from doing that instincts that stop you prevent you from hurting yourself likewise he has instincts within him that stop him prevent him from destroying the ship so he needs other people to destroy the ship he doesn't like marina and he wouldn't mind if she were killed but the main thing is that he's able to summon marina and he knew that, you know, by looking at the rest of the Earth, that the Alpha Flight would follow her. So that's exactly what he wanted. He got all these guys to come up, and they were all looking for each other, and they were all separating. He's doing all these crazy things with the ship to, to keep them separated. And eventually he allows them to inadvertently blow up the ship. Meanwhile, he's able to escape. So now with the ship destroyed, he's finally able to escape. And he'll come back around issue uh, 15. Uh, 15 and 16, I think, are the main ones. And that's, that's, that's some crazy stuff. But then he comes back in multiple other times also where you you see, you know, um, uh, what do you call it? That he's, he's an expert in fighting and he's just ridiculously powerful, like as far as his strength and whatnot. The technology that he's understood by the plot X is such that it's far beyond even what Reed Richards can do. Is he as smart as Reed Richards? No. But he is one with this technology. He knows this technology intimately. He may not be able to, you know, recreate the wheel, so to speak. I'm sure anybody could do that. But you understand what I'm saying? It's not about him creating new technology. It's about this technology is already in his head. And he can just kind of get the pieces together to make them. So he is smart. But it's limited to this radically advanced <laughs> uh, um, technology that already exists. And he's made crazy things before. It's not just uh, um, inorganics that he uses. He'll use in, uh, organic material also. He made the Plot X wolves, which were extremely powerful. And for everything else, just go and check out the uh, 10 Things About Master of the Universe for more. So anyway, that really is the gist <laughs> Of all this stuff. Puck is jacked up. We'll see him again in, the, in issue five. 
But for here, everybody's able to escape. Also, this ties in with, I believe, issue number 260 of the Fantastic Four, which is also written, drawn, and inked by John Byrne. That guy is a beast, and I wish, I hope he made all the money in the world <laughs> for, for all that work that he did, and God bless him. Man, <clears throat> John Byrne is, is awesome in all that regard. Um, what do you call it? So he... Uh, um, he made it so that the Submariner and the Invisible Woman were, were, were found out a little bit about what was going on there in the, in that, that Fantastic Four issue. Meanwhile, everybody else was fighting Terax, uh, including the Silver Surfer. Surfer actually grabs him by the beard and like throws him at one point, throws Terax like that. It's hysterical. Uh, anyway, so Human Torch, the thing and Silver Surfer versus Terax. Great issue. But on top of that is the idea that uh, Namor realized that some some underwater barbarians, you know, they look just like the Atlanteans and they weren't necessarily, excuse me, Lemurians. Just the idea there are a lot of creatures under the sea, which is fine. That makes perfect sense to me. I mean, 70 percent of the Earth's surface is the ocean. And we're talking about underneath the ocean, which is so much larger. So why wouldn't there be more than just Atlanteans and Lemurians down there? There should be more species of, of you know, bipedal type creatures down there than there are on the surface of the earth, for crying out loud. I mean, why not? So they, um, these barbarians, these, these savages, that's what uh, Namor calls them, Namor McKenzie calls them. And he's like, oh, yeah, these guys are coming. They said the only thing they could explain in their limited uh, speech patterns, meaning he couldn't understand what they were saying, they speak a different language, derf, is that uh, the, the ocean became unlivable where they were. So I was like, okay, what's up with that? So he swims all the way out there and his bracelets start to dissipate. He's like, what's going on? And all of a sudden he starts to get hurt. He's like, oh, this really hurts, ow. So he has to get out of there. That's when he finds the invisible woman. They both have to go and figure out what's going on. And it's actually this, the master of the world, uh, what he was doing. So that's why these two were actually involved in the alpha flight. So what a great, like it's, to me, it's just genius. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's genius to me. You want people to be reading your books to make you uh, if not to make you more money, at least to get the uh, the heads at Marvel to realize, oh yeah, look, everything this guy does turns to gold. So of course he's going to do crossover. I remember uh, the X Factor and the and the Thor books when Walt Simonson and uh, um, Louise Simonson were working with each other in perfect collaboration. You know what I'm saying? And, and part of the Mutant Massacre was all about that. Just genius, genius. So uh, I loved that. I loved all of that. So likewise here, Jim Byrne, he, uh, John Byrne, excuse me, he's just in charge of all this. He's like, I'm going to make this guy show up over here and them over there, and it's going to be cool. So he actually says, you know, hey, to find out where these barbarians were, go over to Alpha Flight number four. Hey, to find out where this just happened, this just happened over in issue number 260 of Fantastic Four. Genius. The sales go up, your name is on there, suddenly they're asking you to write more books, maybe you get a pay raise. <laughs> that's awesome. Anyway, guys, that's going to be it. And, um, yeah, again, definitely make sure you check that out. I actually have links below. Listen, I can't, you go and click on those Amazon links. It'll give you access to either a digital copy or a physical copy. Sometimes they'll give you the options of soft cover or hard cover. Um, you purchase those links. I get just a little bit of a kickback and it helps out the channel. All of that money goes towards the channel and improving what I'm doing here. I'm actually trying to build up my website. So that money is going to go directly into the website. I cannot see what you buy. I cannot see who is buying. I cannot see how much is bought. All I can see is that little bit of money is trickling in and that's it. That's literally it. So you have 100% privacy for me. It does not cost you anything extra to use my links. Rather, it's just like it, it's 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 Google, excuse me, um, Amazon saying, oh, hey, we're going to try and sell these things. Oh, this guy has a link to these things. And somebody used his link. He's advertising your stuff. Here you go, man. Here's a couple, you know, pennies towards you. So that's really all it is. <laughs> but I will use every single one of those pennies towards building the website, which will give so many more options to everybody. Full transparency, all right? I'm going to be doing a lot with that website. Anyway, guys, that's going to be it for me. Professor Bill, Comic Book University. Keep reading. Class dismissed.